Good afternoon and welcome everybody. My name is uh, Billy Junker. I'm Associate Professor of Catholic Studies and Co-Director of the Terence J. Murphy Institute for Catholic Thought, Law, and Public Policy at the University of St. Thomas. Uh, it's my great honor uh, today to uh, welcome a distinguished panel for a discussion of a timely and important question. What should we do about Confederate monuments? This is the second discussion of this question the Murphy Institute has hosted in two days, the prior one being hosted yesterday on the Minneapolis campus, and we're very pleased to be able to offer this discussion yet again today. And um, we're very pleased to have with us uh, to address this question, Dr. Yohuru Williams, professor of history and current dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and the author of a book from Rutledge 2015, Rethinking the Black Freedom Movement. Dr. Williams specializes in 20th century American history, history of the civil rights and black power movement, and the African diaspora. We are also pleased to have with us Professor Robert Vischer and Dean of the School of Law at the University of St. Thomas, and Professor Vischer, Dean Vischer, excuse me, Dean, sorry. <laughs> Dean Vischer has uh, also written on the topic of uh, civil rights, history, and legal practice. Uh, he is the author of Martin Luther King Jr. and the Morality of Legal Practice, Lessons in Love and Justice, published by Cambridge in 2012. This is not the whole book, it's the cover. <laughs> Uh, moderating the discussion today will be Dr. David Willard, Assistant Professor of History in the College of Arts and Science at St. Thomas. Dr. Willard focuses on civil rights era and post-reconstruction era, reconstruction era uh, American history. He's working on a book uh, that examines these issues uh, through the lens of Confederate soldiers in the post-Civil War era. So please uh, welcome, along with me, our distinguished panelists, and then I will hand it over to the moderator, Dr. Willard. Thank you, Dr. Junker, not only for the introduction, but also for your work in directing the Murphy Institute and in sustaining the Hot Topics Cool Talk series. And thank you all for joining us for today's program, What Should We Do About Confederate Monuments? On the screen to my right is an image. It's a statue of a Confederate soldier erected in 1913 that stands before the Tallahatchie County Courthouse in Sumner, Mississippi. That statue stood like a sentinel on the same courthouse grounds more than 60 years ago when a jury inside that courthouse acquitted J.W. Milam and Roy Bryant for killing a young African-American boy named Emmett Till one of the most horrific and iconic moments in a long history of white supremacist violence against black bodies. This image of the town square, like scenes throughout the South, and indeed throughout the nation, collapses many moments into one. In this case, it draws our thoughts to 1861, when Mississippi joined the Confederacy and asked its white young men to fight in defense of the premise that in the words of Confederate Vice President Alexander Stevens, the Negro is not equal to the white man. It draws us to 1913, when the United Daughters of the Confederacy erected a monument whose inscription commemorates, quote, the cause that never yet has failed. To 1955, when in the shadow of that monument, Emmett Till's killers walked free. And to 2017, when we gaze upon it and face the responsibility to decide what this icon means to us. Today, we are gathered to discuss the presence of monuments to the Confederacy and to its leaders, its soldiers, and its cause in contemporary American society. This problem has generated debate among Americans from various communities for decades. But the recent white supremacist rally in Charlottesville, organized nominally in defense of that city's statue of Robert E. Lee, has given it fresh relevance. As a native of Virginia and a scholar of the Confederacy, I would have been surprised if before I arrived at St. Thomas, someone had told me that Confederate statues would gain enough traction in public discourse to engage two deans from a university in Minnesota. I might even have wondered what relevance that question had for Minnesotans, seemingly so far removed by geography from the places where figures like Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis stand in granite and marble. 
Such thoughts would have been short-sighted on both counts. First, as we will no doubt learn today, the regional location of, Confederates, of the Confederate States should in no way obscure the fact that the question of its legacy directly involves and indicts all who reside in the contemporary United States. For reasons related to the monument's content, but more strikingly to the moments of their creation, the iconography of the Confederacy and its lost cause proponents uh, uh, and its lost cause proponents attempts to say something clear and unmistakable about who is heroic, who is exemplary, and even who belongs in the United States. Not only white Southerners, but also large swaths of the white Northern public played a significant role in condoning these narratives in the past, and none of us can afford to ignore them in the present. For in considering in, uh, monuments to the past, we must engage with three distinct contexts. The subject of commemoration, the creation and purpose of the commemorative monument, and last but certainly not least, the evolving present of the society that sustains and preserves the monument as a visual text that speaks to our own values. Second, and I say this with overwhelming sincerity and only a tincture of deference to my academic superiors, uh, I can think of, translation, my bosses, I can think of, I cannot think of any academic institution that could furnish two individuals more qualified to engage this question from a variety of historical, political, ethical, and legal angles than our own university. As Dr. Junker noted in his introduction, each of our presenters has a long history of engagement on the complex relationship between historical narratives, public memory, and the search for the common good. Please join me in welcoming both of today's presenters. So a word about our format. Each dean will offer a nine minute presentation on his view of the question. Following each presentation, both Dean Williams and Dean Vischer will have the opportunity to offer an approximately five minute response to the ideas expressed in the other's presentation. And after the presentations and responses conclude, I will ask two introductory questions of both of our presenters. Uh, following that, we'll have ample time for questions from the audience and I anticipate a, a vigorous and engaged uh, Q&A session to follow. Um, with that, and with no further ado, Dean Williams, I invite you to begin. If you can. I love tech issues. Thank you. Nope, not at all. So good morning, everybody. How are you? Hello. It's an interesting question that's posed for us today that we, that we consider when we talk about the question of Confederate monuments and the idea of what to do about them. And I think it's interesting when people ask the question, where does this uh, conversation end? I think it's also important to ask, where does the conversation start? I think for most people, the starting point for this, at least the conversation about the Confederate flag and Confederate monuments, was what happened in Charleston, South Carolina in May of 2015 when Dylan Roof opened fire in the Emanuel AME Church killing nine parishioners. And Bree Newsom, one of many Black Lives Matter protesters, took that opportunity to scale the uh, State House uh, flagpole and take down the Confederate flag. Now everybody fixated on the Confederate flag in that moment, but what we forget is that Confederate flag flew over a Confederate war memorial, a Confederate monument in that space, and that's significant. And I think in asking the question, where do we start, we have to wrestle with the deeper legacy that's represented by the Civil War and Reconstruction. That in fact, even though we like to talk about ourselves post the election of Barack Obama as a post-racial nation, the fact of the matter is that we're far from post-racial and race remains the third rail in American politics. I can find no more apt representation of that than this disturbing cartoon from 1863 in which the cartoonist posed a, a really interesting question to the United States as it was grappling with the possibility of eradicating slavery. Congratulations, Republican Party. You just freed four and a half million slaves. Now what? What's their economic status going to be in the new republic? What's their political status going to be? What's their social status going to be? And if you're not prepared to deal with those questions in a substantive way, you will inject into your republic a source of disorder and chaos that will not easily be rectified in the years to come. When we think about the aftermath of the Civil War and Reconstruction, despite the passage of a 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, various acts meant to ensure absolute equality before the law for people of color, we have been wrestling with the inability 
of that generation to answer that question and in, sub in a substantive way ever since. In fact, some people call it America's original sin, and another political cartoon, I think, aptly captures that. It's the long shadow of slavery, and by extension, social, political, and economic inequality in this country that Confederate flags and Confederate monuments truly represent. In taking on this question in this moment, some people get bogged down on whether removing these statues is erasing history. But the fact of the matter is that it's an opportunity to talk about our history in a fair and honest way, and quite frankly, to engage the specter of slavery and racial inequality in this country. I think it's interesting because this whole kerfuffle over Confederate war memorials has really allowed me to talk about something I think is very significant, at least in the way that Americans, white Americans, experience racial injustice. And I take this from a wonderful book by Jason Soko entitled, There Goes My Everything, White Southerners in the Age of Civil Rights. And note that Soko defines the age of civil rights not in the narrow period from 1954, Brown versus Board of Education, to the assassination of the Reverend Dr. King. No, no, no. Sokol says 1945 to 1975 invoking this idea of a long movement and a long struggle and the fact that we haven't overcome these issues. But Sokol talks about these there goes my everything moments. In fact, it's interesting because this relates powerfully to the introduction that David gave you um, in the beginning in talking about this. These moments where when African Americans or others contest for equal rights, the response by the larger society isn't, this is great. This is an affirmation of our core democratic values. This is what we mean by the unfinished enterprise. This is how we grow as a democracy. The response has been, there goes my everything. 1945, no black folks playing baseball, no civil rights plank in the Democratic Party. Along comes Jackie Robinson. Along comes Harry Truman talking about civil rights. And all of a sudden, you have the birth or the rebirth of the third Ku Klux Klan. You have Dixocrats bolting the Democratic Party. And you have Southern fire eaters talking about resurrecting interposition and nullification as a response to the push for civil rights for African Americans. There goes my everything moments have not served our democracy well. And in some sense, Confederate flags and Confederate war memorials provide aid and comfort to those who are obstructionists to a deeper conversation about making the promise of democracy real. Another good example of a there goes my everything moment was the election of Barack Obama. And we can remember the murder of Congresswoman, Ga or excuse me, the shooting of Congresswoman Gabby Giffords in Arizona and the killing of a young girl by the name of Christina Green. And Barack Obama asking the question quite eloquently without invoking race directly, was this the price for an African-American president? And our inability, again, to have substantive conversations about the shadow of race. And part of that, I think, is rooted in the echoes of the past which reverberate in our present and which we are afraid, we lack the will to confront. A lot of people love this book by ta Coates. The title of the book is Between the World and Me. ta Coates is actually in conversation with the esteemed African-American intellectual W.E.B. Du Bois, who wrote a book in 1903 entitled The Souls of Black Folks, in which he suggested that the problem of the 20th century would be the problem of the color line. I would submit to you that the problem of the 21st century appears to also be the problem of the color line, which is why ta Coates' book had such relevance and continues to have such resonance. But I would point out to you that ta Coates began that book between, or called that book, between the world and me. He is literally in conversation with the boys who wrote in 1903, between me and the other world. And if you don't know that history and you don't know that literature, you don't know that ta Coates is consciously invoking that language to remind us that this is the continuing reverberations of our inability to answer this question. The boys continues. Between me and the other world, there's an ever unasked question, unasked by some through feelings of delicacy, by others through the difficulty of rightly framing it. All nevertheless flutter around it. They approach me in a half sort of way. I me curiously and compassionately, and then instead of saying directly, how does it feel to be a problem? One could go back even further than W.E.B. Du Bois and begin with Frederick Douglass in 1865, who really answered the challenge posed by the failure of the government to really deal substantively with the issue of racial inequality 
When Frederick Douglass was approached by the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society in March of 1865, and they asked Douglass to answer one simple question, what does the Negro want? I'm going to suggest to you that Frederick Douglass and his response foreshadowed the next 100 years of US history. I'm not going to read all of this to you, but I'm going to begin somewhere down the end. Uh, all I ask is give him, the Negro, a chance to stand on his own legs. Let him alone. If you see him on his way to school, ha ha. So picture the images of Little Rock and the Confederate flags and the Confederate monuments that sat outside. Think about the contemporary conversation about public school education today as we confront these issues. Douglas continues, if you see him going to the dinner table at a hotel, here talking about access to places of public accommodation, if you see him going to the ballot box, let him alone. What Douglas is invoking here are what I like to call the six degrees of segregation. The fact that in housing, education, access to places of public accommodation, Jim Crow justice, which remains the most intractable of the six degrees of segregation, our inability to conquer the issue of fair housing in the country. Ultimately, what we have done is, as David pointed out, affirm a Confederate victory, even as we claim a victory over the legal form of slavery. And Confederate monuments and Confederate flags remind us of that in a visual and visceral way. It is why, for some people, they represent such clarion calls for action. It's interesting if we consider that, if we look at these six degrees of segregation, and this is a great cartoon by Herb Locke from 1965. It shows an African-American uh, man being forced off the sidewalk to see segregated housing, accommodation schools, and the gentleman says to him, and remember, nothing can be accomplished by taking to the street. Aha. In fact, in our history, mu uh, much has been accomplished in terms of social movements by taking to the street. And the direct action protest that's taking a, a place around Confederate flags has taken place because it's taken society as a whole so long to deal with this particular issue. Now, there are those who argue if you remove them, then you remove the space for dialogue and discussion. But I would remind all of you that there's part and parcel of this is the false equivalencies that go along with part of this debate. The fact that people don't really want to talk about the, the significance of the civil rights movement this is a really great cartoon. I'm trying to equate the treatment of Betsy DeVos in 2017 with the treatment of Ruby Bridges in 1964. This is not the civil rights movement. I would also say to those who say that those monuments serve a purpose, that I've measured, uh, lectured many, many times at the New York Historical Society uh, in the city of New York. And outside the New York Historical Society, there is one of several mo uh, statues of Frederick Douglass in the city. Now, I know for a fact that Donald Trump has been to the New York Historical Society. He's a fixture in New York. There's no way that you could escape this statue. And yet, in 2017, when Trump visited for Black History Month the National Museum of Af Af African American History in Washington, D.C., these were his comments. I'm very proud now that we have a museum on the National Mall where people can learn about Reverend King, so many other things. Frederick Douglass is an example of somebody who's done an amazing job as being recognized more and more. I know this. <laughs> Harriet Tubman, Rosa Parks, and millions of more black Americans who made America what it is today. Big impact. Despite the fact, and I'm not even going to deal with the fact, that he didn't realize that Douglass was dead. <laughs> I am going to say that it was in the context of a museum of a statue that our president came to a greater realization of the meaning of our history and why it's important and why we should visit it. And so I say to you in conclusion, as I uh, turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Dr. Vischer, this is why I argued in that piece, put the Confederate past where it belongs. The Confederate flag, monuments, and memorials are not harmless remembrances of an honorable war, but our deepest shame as a nation. They perpetuate an acceptance of the long, ugly history of racial oppression in spite of emancipation that follows it. They are symbols of hate, representative of an inglorious past built on the immoral underpinnings of racial slavery. It is time to remove these monuments and put them in spaces like museums that preserve the full story of slavery, where they can foster honest and frank conversations. Maintaining an idealized representation of the past does nothing to lift, lift up the values at the core of our democracy. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the, my own contribution to this dialogue. I would like to uh, offer 
something I called reasoned empathy uh, to, to help navigate uh, the situation we're in currently. Um, the mayor of New Orleans, Mitch Landrew, gave a beautiful uh, speech in announcing his uh, decision to remove four Confederate monuments uh, from the city after months and months of debate and uh, public hearings and committee meetings. Here's just a brief portion of what he said. He said, a friend asked me to consider these four monuments from the perspective of an African-American mother or father trying to explain to their fifth grade daughter who Robert E. Lee is and why he stands atop of our beautiful city. Can you do it? Can you look into that young girl's eyes and convince her that Robert E. Lee is there to encourage her? Do you think she will feel inspired and hopeful by that story? Do these monuments help her see a future with limitless potential? Have you ever thought that if her potential is limited, yours and mine are too? We all know the answer to these very simple questions. When you look into this child's eyes is the moment when the searing truth comes into focus for us. This is the moment when we know what is right and what we must do. We can't walk away from this truth. This passage has uh, reminded me of the powerful passage from Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail where he's describing uh, the episode where his young daughter comes to him to ask why she can't be admitted to the local amusement park, Fun Town. And it's, it's such brilliant uh, writing because the reader of that letter, whatever their race, can experience that pain as a parent, right? It is great at conveying uh, empathy. So in the debate about the Confederate monuments, we're not simply dealing with a series of intellectual propositions. We are encountering real pain. So reasoned empathy. We need more than pure reason. We need to will ourselves to inhabit another person's story, embrace the vulnerability that permits us to see the world, not in the way that keeps me in my comfortable and coherent narrative, but in a way that helps me build cross-cultural understanding, even if it disrupts my own narrative. Civil friendship is a concept from Catholic social teaching that reminds us that our society's health depends much more on the attitudes of citizens toward each other than on any given election's results. Civil friendship requires long, difficult, and sometimes imaginative work to permit your story to shape my story, but it's work that's never been more important. So while we need more than pure reason, we do need reason. I'm not espousing some sort of postmodern version of empathy, where we each take turns explaining our own subjective interpretations of reality and then say, well, I feel your pain, but my truth is just as valid as your truth, so we'll just keep on keeping on in our parallel worlds. That sort of I'm okay, you're okay world may seem attractive on the surface, but it's toxic for civil discourse and ultimately dangerous for society. If every interpretation of a contested social symbol is equally valid, there's really nothing to talk about. We still have to settle the contest, of course, and we'll do it through raw power. That's not a recipe for social cohesion, robust pluralism, or civil friendship. Our capacity for conversations that do real work has been diminished on several fronts, including, but not limited to, our newfound tendency to express our most passionately held views in 140 characters or fewer. On some college campuses today, my strong emotional reaction to your words does not even let me tolerate your words, much less engage them. And cable news grabs viewers through guests who shout past each other, not even pretending to do the heavy lifting of real disagreement. When it comes to Confederate monuments, we need to exercise reason. The history of the monuments matters. The dedication speeches matter. The reason why monuments were not erected immediately after the war, then came in a deluge years later, matters. The location in a town center rather than a cemetery matters. And reason helps us avoid the slippery slope pointed to by opponents of removal. Reason provides limiting principles. So reasoned empathy, I will listen to you, but the facts matter. Fitzhugh Brundage, a history professor at the University of North Carolina, details how at the 1913 dedication of an on-campus monument honoring UNC students who fought for the Confederacy, the featured speaker, the white industrialist and big donor, Julian Carr, unambiguously urged his audience to devote themselves to the maintenance of white supremacy with the same vigor that their Confederate ancestors had defended slavery. 
He praised Confederate soldiers for their defense, quote, of the Anglo-Saxon race during the four years after the war when their courage and steadfastness saved the very life of the Anglo-Saxon race in the South. The four years after the war was a clear reference to the period in which the Ku Klux Klan rose to terrorize blacks looking to claim their newfound freedom. In the same speech at that same dedication ceremony, Carr bragged about horsewhipping, quote, a Negro wench until her skirt hung in shreds because she had disrespected a Southern lady. When a black student on the UNC campus today says that this statue sends a message of exclusion and marginalization as though they are not welcome as equal participants in the UNC campus community, that student is accurately perceiving the intent of those who erected the statue. To respond with, well, I respect your own personal interpretation of the statue, but in my view it's just commemorating a chapter from history, is not taking history or reason seriously. At the same time, calls to take down monuments to George Washington or Thomas Jefferson bear little relationship with calls to take down a statue like the one found at UNC. Jefferson's role in our nation's founding has prompted countless memorials. I'm not aware of any erected to honor his status as a slaveholder or his treatment of Sally Hemings. The legacy of Thomas Jefferson is not without complication or pain, but to interpret efforts by the American political community to honor Jefferson as intending to exclude or marginalize blacks is also not taking history or reason seriously. Now one very tentative misgiving I have about monument removal. Empathy requires reminders that my lived reality is not the only lived reality. Historical markers or memorials can serve as these reminders. If our choices between keeping Confederate statues and ridding all public space of reminders of our society's racist history, I may opt for keeping the statues. We cannot let the removal of the statues contribute to the myth that we have finally arrived as a society that has transcended race. The election of President Obama led some to say, okay, we did it. You're not allowed to complain about racial injustice anymore. There may be a temptation to do the same in this case. If we don't have to see or talk about that statue in the town square that's a product of American racism, we no longer have to grapple with the ongoing legacy of racism. Americans are very good at avoiding unpleasant aspects of our history. Will removal of these statues facilitate that avoidance? The history offered by museums confronts only those who choose to be confronted. How do we bring history? even the painful parts of our history, into our everyday reality so that we cannot avoid knowing. Finally, a word about process. If reasoned empathy is our goal, process matters. The process is itself an act of remembrance. In my view, the city of New Orleans did it very well. Public hearings, multiple committees, it took a long time, it was transparent, and it was grueling. Removing statues under cover of darkness, either individuals toppling them as an act of defiance or a city taking them down in a way that avoids public protest, is not conducive to reasoned empathy because it's an exercise of raw power, not of shared remembrance. Life in a pluralist democracy will be messy. Opponents of removal will win some and they'll lose some. But the debate itself makes us all face a truth that we may prefer to avoid and to encounter a lived reality that may not be our own. There's value in that, even if the statue doesn't come down. Thanks. So now I'm gonna invite Dean Williams if you'd like to respond to Dean Vischer's comments briefly. First and foremost, yes, I agree. Um, I think the interesting thing about what Dean Vischer suggests is that America could benefit from something along the lines of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which he had in South Africa, an opportunity to fairly and frankly confront our history and our past. And I think that's the reason why New Orleans is such a good example about how that process can play out. At the same time, next year, uh, April 4th, 2018, we'll celebrate the 50th anniversary of the assassination, or commemorate the 50th anniversary of the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. September 1st, 1967, 50 years ago, 
Dr. King addressed the American Psychological Association, and he told that body that it was the duty of social scientists in particular to contribute to broader discourses about race and injustice in, America, in, in American society. And at, at the core of that, there had to be a will and a desire to take action, to produce studies that were in the public interest, and also to encourage people to obey the law, but to recognize that sometimes the only way to change a law is to challenge that unjust law by breaking it. While I agree with Dean Vischer, and I certainly as a historian um, and a lover of art, and some of those statues, quite frankly, are quite breathtaking in their construction, would never encourage the destruction of those statues for the sake simply of the destruction of those statues. If the conversation becomes stalled, there has to be a way for people to register their discontent and to move that conversation forward. If not for the vandalism, if not for the removal of the statues in the cover of night, maybe we're not having this debate right now. But I also would not want to get lost in that conversation, the fact that it wasn't the removal of bronze and marble statues that began all this. It was the killing of black and brown bodies in public spaces, the likes of which the nation refused to address, going way back to Trayvon Martin, that really began this national conversation and in all of the ways that it has morphed since then, from taking knees at NFL games to reckless tweets. The bottom line is that we're talking about something that is at the base of our constitutional enterprise, something that is expounded upon in our founding documents by a slaveholder, yes, Thomas Jefferson, but also probably one of the most eloquent spokespersons for liberty and democracy the world has ever known. And he said it quite well. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Where is our concern over the life that produced the angst over the flags and the statues. Thank you. Dean Vischer, if you'd like to respond to anything that Dr. Williams has said. I agree. <laughs> uh, so I guess, you know, we, we have a little, I think we have different points of emphasis rather than a real sharp disagreement. And, and another way that I could come at my discomfort is not so much about the debate about Confederate memorials, but how it fits in with our broader rethinking of history. So my, for those of you who uh, follow Twin Cities News and renaming news, uh, my kids go to what was Alexander Ramsey Middle School in Minneapolis that's now Justice Page School. And I think it, it all turned out well. At the beginning of that process, I was a little bit taken aback. Uh, I think one of my daughters came back and announced that they had taken a, had taken a student vote about what they should name the school instead of Alexander Ramsey, and it was, it was the Prince School. And I, you know, I, I like Prince, but I just thought, wait a second, this is, that's way too easy to, to get to. So my, you know, and Alexander Ramsey, for those of you who don't know, was an was a, a, a early governor of, of Minnesota who had called for the extermination uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the wake of the uh, Indian Settler War of, of the Native American tribes. And so certainly not, certainly not a model for students, especially at a school like this school that is so uh, heavily students of color. And I totally get that. My concern is Americans tend to go for the quick fix, right? Oh, it, yeah, forget about Ramsey. Who do we like now? We like Prince, right? Hey, it's Prince. It's print the Prince School. And I, you know, so can we, can we rethink some of the models and some of the honorings that we do uh, and, and the memorials? without just taking the quick fix to try to forget the painful parts of our history. That's it. And, and in, in their defense, in the Minneapolis Public Schools defense, they ended up doing a very good job, and they, they made the students get into the weeds on the hard question and the work. So I came out supportive, but I think that runs against what has been the mainstream of American culture, which is Let's do a quick fix, and then we're going to move on and not think about it again. And that's one of my concerns in this area, too. Thanks. All right. Now we'd like to 
ask some questions, and I'll take the prerogative to ask the first one. Um, and it's essentially, should we be having this debate at all? Is removing monuments the right place to pursue social justice? Is it potentially too risky because of the nuance of attachments that some feel to the content of these monuments? Is combating white supremacy in granite, bronze, and marble too insubstantial when oppression appears so often in the living flesh of the present, in voter suppression practices, in equities in the realm of criminal justice, and seemingly impenetrable economic stratification? I'll ask you both to respond. Dean Williams, if you'd like to begin. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question, and I think it's a two-pronged attack. You have to attack the symbols of inequality and justice at the same time that you work on the deeper structural issues that produce that inequality. I think the interesting thing about this moment for me is that, and it, it ties back to something Dean Vischer um, talked about. In the opening to the American History series, John Hope Brinklin and Abraham Eisenstadt write, every generation writes its own history for it tends to see the past in the foreshortened perspective of its own experience. Now, maybe we don't want to print school, but it's incumbent on us every couple years to revisit our values and to, want, and to reflect on whether the people that we honor really match up to what it is that we profess as a society and a culture. One of my favorite constitutional law decisions penned by Earl Warren was in Trott versus Dulles, and it was an Eighth Amendment case. And Earl Warren, in writing for the majority, said that a nation needs to draw um, its standards of decency from emerging or evolving standards of decency that mark the progress of a maturing society. We don't draw on quarter people anymore. And so therefore, that's a good thing, because we've moved away from that arcane and medieval practice. We also shouldn't honor slaveholders anymore. And part and parcel of our discussion is looking at the statuary that sits in the Capitol building and asking ourselves whether it's appropriate that that statuary reflect individuals who fought to dismantle the Union. And I draw a distinction between slaveholders and those who actively pursued rebellion in the hopes of maintaining a system of white supremacy which the Confederacy, as Alexander Stevens in his famous Cornerstone uh, address pointed out, was all about. There are deeper conversations to be had about other aspects of this. So Minnesota gets off the hook because it doesn't have a Confederate war memorial, but it does have a Calhoun Lake. Yale University had a Calhoun College. People ask the question, where does it stop? I think part of the question is our interrogation of the past as part of the liberal arts, as timeless education never stops. Our interrogation of our values never stops. It's the reason why we invest so heavily in the idea that education as an enterprise should deepen one spiritually, emotionally, as well as intellectually. As Martin Luther King famously wrote, if we're not careful, you'll have guided missiles and misguided men. I think that guided men and women take on the challenge of addressing inequality in marble and stone. And in destroying it and raising questions, force us to contend with the deeper values which we claim inform our democratic practice, but are also often window dressing to the perpetuation of inequality. Uh, Dean Vischer, your response. Yeah, so uh, in terms of whether this is the debate to have, I think I'm completely unqualified to, to say where a debate should arise when I'm not a person who's been bearing the pain on, on these different fronts. I mean, it arises where it arises. I think the key, though, is uh, can it keep going and where, where does it go? Because you know, if, if, we, if we view Confederate monuments as the sum total of what matters in this, we're missing the whole point, and that's one of my concerns it had you know I was very encouraged over the last few years about how deep bipartisan and reflective the debate about criminal justice reform had uh, had uh, gone in this country that's changed a bit over the last uh, several months and I don't know if we'll be able to get back to that but those those are are that's where the debate has to aim eventually and I, I mentioned this yesterday um, where uh, those of you who are local here, of course, remember some of the protests that Black Lives Matter has, has led over the past two or three years. And one of those protests was uh, shutting down I-94 on a 
dark, rainy night. And that protest was led by one of our former colleagues at the law school, Nikima Levy Pounds. And so I was given the opportunity to talk to many members of the public who were interested in sharing their views on the episode with me by phone or email or just <laughs> yelling across the street. Uh, and uh, so one thing that I would respond, and this, this ties back to the monument debate, is because um, it, it was usually a conversation from one white man to another white man or, or white woman, and, and uh, I would say, how desperate would you have to be to walk out on I-94 on a rainy, dark night with your kids to stop traffic? Whether you agree with the tactic or not, it's not about that, but how desperate would you have to feel? And can we, can, can we aim the conversation there to have some understanding of that desperation? Right? And so in this context, wherever the debate arises, okay, it's at the Town Square Confederate Memorial. And instead of saying, just get over it. I mean, it's just a statue. Say, how can we go deeper to understand why this matters so much? Regardless of what the outcome is, but let us at least get a flavor of the pain that would make a big portion of our fellow citizens care so much about this statue that's been there for 80, 100 years. Thank you both. At this point, we'll open the floor up to questions. <laughs> From all of you, uh, I'd ask that you first raise your hand and wait for Sean, who's got the mic, to come reach you with the microphone before you ask your question. I'd also ask that you ask a question. Um, and please keep it in a form that, that merits and, and, and uh, seeks a response. Thank you. First hand I saw is Michaela over there. Hi. Hi. Um, we spoke a lot about monuments, but I have a question more so about memorials. Do you believe that America has any obligation to memorialize Confederate soldiers? And if so, what would be the proper time and place to do so if there was even a proper time and place? You're making eye contact with me, but I'm gonna pretend oh, you're sorry. making <laughs> eye contact with <laughs> Dean Williams. So you, you were looking at him, right? Never argue with the law, Dean. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a great question, Mikhail, and I think the answer for me is yes. Um, I'm a big uh, proponent of, or not proponent, I'm a person who regularly visits battlefields. I think that's an appropriate place where you can commemorate what happened in that space, re regardless of what the cause people fought for, because that space has been, by virtue of being set aside for that purpose, um, created to remember and to mark the battle, who was there, so on and so forth. So I believe that's appropriate. Um, but that's very limited for me, and that would be. Now, I also think there's space to create markers that aren't statues, that don't necessarily memorialize an individual, but that remind us of the importance or significance of an action relative to a space. It's a very different conversation. But remember, markers, by their very nature, have context built into them. They're not simply the bronze or marble representation of a human being. They're an invitation for the person to read, and in the process of reading, be invited into a larger discussion about the meaning of that space. Thank you. Dean Vischer, did you want to respond or? I, he said it well. He said it well. I agreed. <laughs> All right, next question then. Uh, hello. Um, I have a question. So how much do you both think education plays a part in this? I know like in high school it's like a little bit of slavery and all the US presidents and that's pretty much all you get. But I know like for example in Germany, very extreme example, they spend like a whole like two or three years talking about World War II and the legacy of Hitler and all those things. So kids are very well educated over there about the history of their country. So how, m so wh what could the US be doing to I guess kind of like mirror what they're doing in Germany I guess? Well, I'm not an education expert. I, I just observing my children's education, um, more conversation is always better. And when the conversation can transcend this uh, key fact recitation, that's a really good thing. 
there might need to be some key fact recitation along the way just for context and test purposes or whatever is going on. But, and it's one thing that was great about the renaming of my kids' middle school is eventually, not at first, but eventually they had to go deeper and it was in a context that mattered to them, right? So they had to understand why the legacy of Ramsey causes pain. And they had to put that in the historical context there. I mean, I don't want to, uh, you know, in my view, we have to be careful not to, uh, not to eradicate a sense of hope in our understanding of history. Uh, so it can't just be one current hot button cause for deep cynicism and despair about the future of the world at, at a time. There has to be sort of a broader sweeping arc to it, but it has to be contextual in terms of, of the real life that, that we're living as Americans. I, I couldn't agree more. And the only thing I would add to that is that when you talk about that education, Kathy Cohen and others have done a lot of work with the idea of, of wounds and how wounds produce narratives. And wounds that go unaddressed really manifest themselves in the way that people see society and the way that they define themselves in relation to that society. We live in a world now where there's a lot of emphasis, emphasis on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, um, as the um, savior for how we can compete with the rest of the world. But a nation that doesn't invest in understanding and appreciating its history and creating space to have those conversations, a nation that doesn't invest in saying that there's something to be uh, gained by a deep investigation of that history, but also the literature that's attendant, right? So you don't take Huck Finn out of the schools. You use Huck Finn as an opportunity to talk about where a society was, and you teach the history around it. That work is interdisciplinary, it's deep, but it's essential in the process of really coming to grips with how did this happen, and how can we prevent it from happening again, or at least say that we've had the conversations and we're in a position to believe, you know, hubris aside, that we've done the work necessary to ensure that if we stumble into this again, we can't claim that we stumbled. Next questions, second row. So this is kind of a technical question, but kind of not. So there was a judge in Mississippi, a municipal judge who, mm -hmm. who wanted the state flag to be removed from his courtroom, and he claimed that blacks were harmed and that there was an equal protection violation. But the Fifth Circuit, Court of Appeals in a three-judge panel ruled that they had to show an actual or imminent injury, um, not just show differential government messaging. So how would you argue that there is an actual imminent injury based <laughs> on a government action that hurts an individual? For a bit of context, the Mississippi State flag is the one we saw at the beginning. It has the, the notorious uh, Confederate battle flag in its upper left-hand quadrant. So when you see that flag, you're seeing the Confederate flag in miniature. Oh, I'm the lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> Darn it. Uh, OK, so I would actually agree with the Fifth Circuit. Is, uh, if we go down the path of that being a, a differential treatment for equal protection purposes, that's, it's, it's much harder to start identifying limiting principles. I think your question raises a bigger question that goes beyond the, the debate over Confederate monuments, and that is, how do we as a legal system want to respond to what we would call dignitary harms as opposed to tangible harms, right? So when, when you're, Jim Crow, was, it, in retrospect now, Jim Crow is a pretty easy case because all of Southern society was hardwired for the subjugation and exclusion of African Americans, right? No public accommodations, you know, what, jobs, housing, et cetera. That's easy to see the harm, in retrospect. I mean, at the time, it was hard for some people, but in retrospect, easy to see that harm. Demeaning messages, demeaning images, and I'll take it out of the race context just to see it's a bigger issue. This, uh, this fall, the U.S. Supreme Court is uh, hearing the, the case of the cake baker who uh, declined the request to uh, create a cake for a same-sex wedding saying that that he's an artist and that violated his own religious uh, convictions to do that. The couple in question could have gone to a number of bakers in town and gotten the cake they needed, but it's that harm, that message being received 
because of who you are and the relationship you're entering into, I withhold my services from you. What do we do as a society with that sort of harm? And I would liken that a little bit to uh, the Confederate flag harm. Not, I'm not saying it's not a harm. In my own view, it, we're getting into some dicey territory when we try to overlay sort of the heavy-handed legal remedy for dignitary harms in our country, right? Law functions pretty well as a sledgehammer. And when we want to maintain uh, robust pluralism in our country where people live out their uh, divergent beliefs and commitments, I think we're much better off focusing on the tangible denials of goods and services deemed fundamental for participation in our society, rather than this sense of, you know, I am demeaned by this. The answer to that is political action, protest, boycott, et cetera, as opposed to we are going to shut you down because of the dignitary harm you're causing. Next question, this side, fourth row, and then we'll, right, oh, yeah. never mind, the Mike's already there. <laughs> Dr. Lawrence. Um, first of all, I want to thank you all for this great conversation. Thank the Murphy in Institute for uh, bringing everyone together. I just have a question. Um, conversations that we have like this um, in Minnesota kind of uh, concern me sometimes because I think that there's a potential for us to sort of look at the South and make Southerners into these sort of horrible villains um, mm -hmm. with you know, blood dripping from their mouths or something like that. Um, and when we think about uh, memorials and monuments, the thing that they do is they construct and preserve uh, white supremacist spatial ideologies, right? And um, that doesn't just exist in Atlanta or Charlottesville, it exists in the Twin Cities. Um, I think like a segregated neighborhood is a monument to white supremacy, and a shuttered school in an urban neighborhood is a monument to white supremacy. So my question is, how can we broaden the conversation or maybe even the question so that we can talk about ways that we are implicated in this whole thing as Northerners and that we're not just pointing the finger at Southerners and sort of you know, letting ourselves off the hook. You just did. <laughs> 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 uh, let me say two things. I think um, first and foremost, um, when I came from my interview, uh, Victoria and the Art History Department took me to the monument section of the Capitol where there's a Roy Wilkins monument. And it's interesting because the Wilkins monument is not a statue. It's this kind of odd collection of, of I, don't know, I don't know what. And there's, a, there's kind of a bizarre explanation that goes along with it. But what I love about that space and what I've come to appreciate about that memorial is exactly an invitation to do exactly what Dr. Lawrence just said. Um, it's Roy Wilkins and the sweep of his career in attacking segregation in all of its manifestations and reminding folks in Minnesota that, wait a minute, Roy Wilkins was from here. And Roy Wilkins never let the Twin Cities off the hook or let Minnesota off the hook because racism and inequality are national problems. Uh, the idea of the South and locating this somehow, as you pointed out, um, as a Southern problem has been the root of a lot of problems in American society. It's why Gunnar Myrtle, the Swedish economist in 1944, pinpoint racism as a uniquely American problem. And our comfortability, as we do with so many other things, to project onto um, the other, and in this case, the other is a Southerner, um, distinguished by his accent and his geographic or her geographic region and um, ways and customs becomes responsible for a system that, quite frankly, uh, the entire nation benefited from. I think the difficult conversations that are happening on campuses like Yale, um, that are happening in cities like Boston, um, that are happening in spaces like uh, to he here today are part and parcel of this reckoning with you know, our national shame over slavery. But I also would say, Dr. Lawrence, and I agree with you, it doesn't end there because then you, you don't, you know, I, I'd like to see a McGee uh, Snipes memorial, right, or marker, because then you're starting to talk about restrictive covenants and what that meant. Um, I'd like for us to, to talk about Otabenga, the pygmy in the Bronx Zoo. Right? Because then you start to talk about the importance of scientific racism, and it moves beyond this simple conversation about the Civil War, which is one episode in a, in a very long and ugly book about inequality in this country. So uh, it's, a, it's an absolutely key question that uh, I struggle with, and I struggle with it is we, humans in general, Americans more particularly, Minnesotans even more particularly, we don't like conflict, <laughs> okay? 
So I remember back when I was practicing law, one of the pro bono projects I did is I, w I th this was in Chicago at a time when Chicago was uh, tearing down some of their high rise housing projects and then they would give folks uh, Section 8 vouchers to send them into the suburbs where I grew up in the suburbs. And so I would do a housing rights seminar for residents of the public housing projects as they were about to go up. And I remember the first time I went and did that, I went in thinking that I was gonna be like hailed as a conquering hero. They're gonna be so happy because the Robert Taylor homes are going away and they get to go live in the suburbs like where I lived. And isn't that gonna be great? It's gonna be a celebratory spirit. And those of you who know more than I did at the time know that was not the case at all. The people were terrified. And that was, that was one of the first times where I had to really confront the discomfort for my own narrative of what it meant to be a person of color in my same area where I grew up, not the South. In Minnesota, there is a, such a powerful story to, to tell that is now getting harder to avoid given a lot of the current events that have happened. And you can, I mean, this is a whole nother subject of, you, you go back to 1948 and almost half of the new housing developments in the Twin Cities had racial restricted covenants attached to them. At the same time, the Federal Housing Authority was, uh, would not insure mortgage lenders in high risk neighborhoods. The high risk neighborhoods were not all, but mostly neighborhoods of color. And so you had uh, African-American families especially legally pushed out of the uh, of certain neighborhoods and then had no mortgage access in the other neighborhoods. And you have a whole segment of the population frozen out of the biggest housing boom in American history post-World War II. And that's no wonder why now, even though African-American household is uh, 60, 65% household income, 60, 65% of white household income, average uh, African-American household wealth is 10% of average uh, white wealth because the vast majority of household wealth is home equity. So it's that story when people get, they say, wow, that's an issue there, but getting them into that, that's why the Confederate monument debate is super productive if you can get into that deeper stuff. The question is, can we avoid our own tendency to say, okay, the statue is gone, let's go talk about something else now. Got a question down front and then we'll come back to Dr. Junker. Pardon? No, Elena, sorry. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Dr. Junker, quick follow up. Elena, take it up with him. Elena, up here, in front, not in the back. The front is close to me. The back is close to that. Not anything at all. Just stand up. Okay. Um, so, Dean Vischer, you talked a lot about the quick fixes and wanting to avoid the quick fixes. Yeah. And maybe this is kind of a question that nobody knows the answer to. But so, how do you suggest continuing that conversation? Dean Williams, you talked about museums maybe being the place where these monuments belong. But if we don't have to confront them, if we're not going to museums, then how are we? What's the next step leaving this room? How do we continue to promote those conversations? That it's, a, it's a great question. Let me, let me answer the, the, the teaching question first, because I think part and parcel of this is, when I talked about a deep investment in American public education, part and parcel of that is an appreciation that, again, if you live in a community, you have a responsibility to confront its history. So it would be rethinking the way that we teach history, history that would be national but also communal. And by that I mean that you should not graduate from this uh, a high school in the state of Minnesota without knowing about the history of this state um, in relation to the history of the United States as a whole. That's an opportunity to, to visit um, things like museums and that helps to perpetuate uh, the arts in a way, it helps to perpetuate preservation and those are important things if a society is gonna grow, if it's gonna mature. So I think that's one avenue to look at. Now we have a huge divestment in this mo at this moment under Betsy DeVos not to let the Obama administration off the hook because Arne Duncan wasn't much better in being so fixated on STEM that we're not talking about preservation and we're not talking about those spaces and we're not talking about a partnership between classroom teachers, university professors, and those involved in a museum and, uh, and archives world to preserve and present that history in a way that's tangible and relevant in the ways that Dr. Vischer talked about. So not a simple solution because that requires money and political will which are painfully absent in the present 
um, discourse about these issues. But that's one way to tackle it. The second question I think is a little harder, and it's one of the reasons that I love um, Rob's book, uh, the subtitle of which is uh, about uh, looking at King and, and dealing with the difference between, uh, or, or finding the, the space between love and justice, because they're very different asks when you think about it. And you can have a, or you can build a law, or you can appreciate the law from the standpoint of which it is predicated on producing those types of reforms, revisions, that ultimately, in creating more equality, make us all more secure. You know, away from the popular constitutionalism that we see today, away from, or you can talk about justice, which is people, which is what people like, uh, or I'm sorry, order, which is what people like Eugene Bull Connor talked about. And we want to maintain order, right? We want to break down heads, and that's never productive. You can't get to that medium space without investing in and creating pathways for people to confront their history. And the things that, quite frankly, and again, I'll say this, um, I was disappointed when President Obama was described um, art history as an easy major, and people shouldn't be major. And that bothered me. I understand where he's coming from, because when we're so involved and in, in kind of invested in tech, we miss the fact that our history and culture are really important to understanding where we are. And the great social questions that we ha are left to confront are going to be confronted through that history. These are questions that, don't, that transcend race in this sense. Um, this came up in our conversation yesterday. We were talking about the Arizona case. Everyone talks about Black Lives Matter. I am deeply invested in that movement. I think it's an important movement. Uh, but there have been questions and fragmentation in that movement because we're not addressing the issue of what happens to black and brown bodies that are queer, lesbian, gay, transgender. So there's this whole question of how we haven't confronted homophobia, we haven't confronted sexism. And what, you know, Hillary Clinton in 2008 said the glass th ceiling has you know, about a million cracks in it, but they still keep raining down and cutting us in the process because we haven't overcome in a substantive way the deeper injustices that go along with that. See the Google memo this summer where if there weren't women in, so I think that in this sense, and I mentioned this the other day and I'm kind of going long on this one, you need in society opportunities to be able to diagnose where you put that critical care. Um, I had heart surgery a couple years ago, and before you have the surgery, they make you drink this really nasty concoction, and it shows them where the potential problems are. Um, first and foremost, the concoction was nasty. But <laughs> thank goodness they were able to do that. I think sometimes when you, when you do what Rob talks about, both in his book and what he talked about today, you allow the problems to present themselves in a natural way. That's where you know where to do the work. We have major work to do in terms of homophobia in this country. We still have significant work, work to do with regard to race. We have significant work with, uh, with regard to gender. We just have to do that work. And it's not all going to take place in courthouses. It's going to involve the kind of uncomfortable dialogue and discussion that, that we've been talking about today that Dr. Lawrence alluded to. And I would say to all the students in the room, one way to do that is in the College of Arts and Sciences by getting a minor or degree in American. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. And then, of course, if you want to actually change society, you go to law school. Uh, just one, one quick word and follow up on that of how you affect change in this. I think it's really important to find common cause with uncommon allies, right? That's one of the reasons there is such hope on criminal justice reform is because you had very conservative figures, including very conservative evangelical organizations coming along and saying, this is wrong, the over-incarceration problem. And there was just beautiful things happening in that front. And one of the, I think one of the core challenges we've had with climate change in this country is that the earliest champion that everybody knew was Al Gore. And they already had set opinions on him. And so nothing he would say I mean, I think about what the debate would look like now if it had been a conservative environmentalist coming up in the, in the tradition of Teddy Roosevelt, how that would have changed. So looking across the aisle, the divide, whatever, and even if you don't agree on everything, find something you agree with that you can partner with. So, it, I mean, we are just segmenting and balkanizing so much in our society. You've gotta, we've got to break out of that when we can. All right, we're running close on time. I'm going to use moderator's prerogative once more to ask the final question, uh, and I hope you'll both disagree a little bit. You've been models of civilized and, and, and engaged dialogue on topics that are deep and potentially um, fraught, and I appreciate that. I hope the audience does as well. 
Uh, but I want to make you disagree a little bit, um, and it's to ask a question that Dean Vischer raised first in his presentation, which is, does the context or location or content of a monument to the Confederacy matter? Or is the association with the Confederacy, and by extension with the defense of slavery, a categorical justification for removal? And more importantly, how do we decide? How do we actually engage that work if we do acknowledge that there is some degree of difference? Categorical justification for removal for me. Okay. And we did disagree. The College of Arts and Sciences is a logical home. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I would say, and this is where I, I would say these decisions need to be, when possible, made locally. And I know in the civil rights context, there is a lot of baggage that comes with that. I just think that it's, if it's going to be an act of shared remembrance that is more than just take the easy fix. There has to be uh, deep local engagement, even if that results in an outcome that is suboptimal, as they would say. All right, uh, before we conclude, I want to mention that October 17th, the next installment of the Hot Topics Cool Talk series will take place on the question of wel welfare block grants and um, policy implications thereof. Um, and as we conclude, let me ask you to, to join me in thanking both Dean Vischer and Dean Williams for engaged presentations on a difficult topic. <laughs>